Let's start with the guest of honor and plenary speaker for this session. She is the founder of the Pink Power Farm in Calegraya, Laguna. It's considered as a pioneering commercial aeroponics. Have you heard of hydroponics? Maybe you have heard of hydroponics. No? Uh, it's one of the pioneering farms in Asia using this technology. Well, traditionally, we plant and grow our plants using soil and water or water, I guess, and hydroponics. But our speaker will show us that it's possible to go into farming even if you don't have problems. I have seen similar technologies in Japan. And it's possible also to do that. It's also possible uh, to do it in our countries, in Philippines and other neighboring countries in Asia. This is indeed a very innovative approach in farming. Our speaker, is a very successful entrepreneur, having established various businesses. She started the Philippines' first corporate social HIV awareness campaign 17 years ago through her hotel chain, the very popular Victoria Court. If you look for that, maybe you will not see it anymore because it's now known as Hotel Ava. She is a car enthusiast, a blogger, and a farmer, among other things. She's so concerned with the flight of uh, our planet, and so she is very passionate in doing something about it. She's also an animal welfare advocate and has been promoting the adoption of an orphan or abandoned animals instead of going to pet shops to buy uh, animals for your pets. In her farm, she also operates an apiary. It's a bee uh, and she's using, she has a collection of the different uh, native bees. I'm sure you know the increasing importance of bees in farming, especially fruits and vegetable farming. They're very critical for uh, pollination. In fact, I have to share again my experience in Japan. Some entrepreneurs went into uh, creating colonies of bees and then they rent it out during the blooming stage, especially of apples and peaches and pears. So they don't grow vegetables or fruits, they grow bees to be rented out. So our speaker, today we talk about a very important and timely topic, how innovations could improve farmers' income through fruits and vegetable farming. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Miss Angelina Mitki. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys still have energy. Usually after lunch, I feel super sleepy, but thank you for the introduction. Um, this is my first public speaking engagement about farming, and I want to thank Dr. Mina Gabor for actually um, convincing me to do this because it helped me put together all the ideas that we've done in the farm. And I started the farm project as a retirement project, but the pandemic fast-tracked the whole project. And I got into farming firstly because I wanted to be a bee farmer. And we'll start with the presentation. So as you can see with my logo, King Power Farm, I had bees. I was very naive when I did this logo because I thought, I'll buy some bees, I'll plant some trees, everything should be easy. But it wasn't. So, I want to do a little icebreaker just so that you guys are awake. I found a joke last night was fitting to the farming community. 
And it goes like this. Why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they're lactose. Anyway, where are we? King Tower Farm is located in Kalaraya Lake. If you guys didn't know, Kalaraya Lake is on top of a man-made lake. And we are 1,200 feet above sea level. And uh, the lake is a hydroelectric dam which connects to Lumot Lake and Laguna de Bay. And uh, during the weekends, they pump all the water up. And during the weekdays, when they need power in the city, they pump all the water down. This is a current video of my farm where we're growing pet chai, lettuce, kampong, habanero peppers, um, and other vegetables also. So I want to share the innovation and technology that we've been doing in our farm. But the towers were sort of a shortcut to real farming. And I want to explain also that we've always been into real farming. It's just that we were stuck with very poor soil. So as I said, we're located in Kalarai Lake. I started as a retirement project, wanting to be an apiarist, but realizing that to be an apiarist, I needed to have a food forest. And to have a food forest, I needed to have lots of fruit trees and plants all around the area, which led me into the tower farms. Because the tower farms for me were the shortcut way to produce vegetables at a rapid pace without having to make healthy soil. So I put here a weight. When I inherited my farm, when my dad passed away, my farmers were already telling me, nothing will grow here. We've been through biodynamic farming. We've been through so many farming methods. Um, it's very difficult to plant here. And obviously being young and naive, I was like, no, we'll find a way. So with sheer, sheer experimentation, in 2009, I started my first aquaponic experiment in my condominium. I had a goldfish tank and some grow beds. I was able to grow kampong, ampalaya, mongo out of the balcony of my house. And my neighbors were shocked. They were like, how's that growing there? And I explained aquaponics, the symbiotic relationship of fish culture with plants, having the fish basically poop and feed the plants and the plants will clean the water and basically go back to the fish. And that was my first experiment at the farming, and I was hooked. So in 2016, when I inherited our lake property, I was like, okay, buy the bee colonies, buy a bunch of fruit trees, and we started planting. These are our dwarf coconut trees. It's very bare at the moment. And this was the soil that we're working with. If you guys are familiar with this, this is not soil, actually, it's clay. It's called Louisiana clay. And clay, clay is one of the more difficult growing mediums to work with. It has poor water infiltration. If you pour water on it, it just lights off. And because of that, it's very compact. It's nutrient fixation. It takes nutrients from your organic matter because it's inert. And it has very low organic matter, so it's not a good home for biodiversity. Plus, it's also very acidic. It is uh, 3.8 to about 4.5 pH. So, being that uh, we were working with this, um, I want to give a brief history of how my farm started. In 2016, I did the bees. I went from 300 colonies, thinking I could grow into 3,000 colonies in five years. But I was, uh, I guess I got hit with reality because knowing that we were trying to plant on clay, and clay was not allowing us to make the farm flourish. So because of that, I got into the tower farming in 2019 to help augment my uh, poor soil. So we got into tower farming because we found it was the fastest way to produce fruits and vegetables in our environment. But in between, we never gave up with soil farming. We were working on the soil, but we were using chemicals back then, spraying the triple 14, the 10, 10, 10. Um, you guys are very familiar with that also. And then in uh, 2019, we also started the first floating farm experiment just for sharing with people that even if you don't have land, you can farm on the water. And we were using water hyacinths, which were basically uh, a water pests. And uh, we'll show you a video of that also. And then in 2020, we decided to go organic 
we watched a YouTube, uh, we watched a documentary online called The Biggest Little Farm. If you guys haven't seen it, it's a beautiful story. It basically shows you the power of vermicomposting or vermicasting, and that's what we did in our farm. We started our own vermicompost in 2020. Here are our UP Los Baños bee team, along with the boxes for the stingless bees. From 300 colonies, we went down to 200 colonies, and in the year after, we went down to 100 colonies. It was very difficult, very disheartening for us also. And this was the first version of my tower farm. So it's outdoor. As you can see, it's still very lush. But our consultant had his farm in Ibiza. Ibiza, if you guys know, is very Mediterranean. It doesn't get heavy amounts of rain. There's no best. So then having your farm outdoor was OK. But for us, we were at the mercy of the rain and then getting pests also. This is version two of the tower farm. Through the years, we always innovate and see how we can become more efficient, produce more vegetables, and we ended up covering with an agricultural fabric to reduce the rains from diluting our nutrient solution, but we were still succumbed to pests. Here I am posing with one of the towers. If you notice the pechai, the pechai already looks good, but just take note of how big they are, because I'll show you the pechai now. Here also is our land preparation. As, you, as I said, I never gave up on soil farming. Um, we started to plant a thousand calamansi trees. Calamansi being that they give fruit year-round. They love acidic soil. And uh, everyone loves calamansi. So it made sense. Plus the bees seem to take to it. The stingless bees seem to take to the calamansi. And this is a video of our floating farm. The concept is actually from um, an old Mexican Chinampas, and then you can actually research Bangladesh floating farms on YouTube also. And we use water hyacinth as the medium. The concept is relatively almost free. The only input that we had was labor plus nylon string to tie the raft together. But basically, we were able to show people that we could farm even on the water. So in 2021, we transitioned to natural farming. We gave up all the spray chemicals and we decided to go organic using our own compost. And also 2021, I went into Hugo culture raised beds. Hugo culture, I'll explain more and elaborate more later. And then I also started my first bamboo farm in 2022. And then we did our version three for the greenhouse for the King Tower Farm because we learned so many things from the version two that we decided to do a new version. And just recently we added European honeybees to our farm. So I have 20 colonies now that we're working with. And then lastly I put aquaponic experiment. I built a very big aquaponic pond and I think I got over zealous because uh, back then we were trying to balance the fish waste with the plants and because of the size of my pond, which I'll show you later, we couldn't get it to work, so we're still working hard at that. This is a sample of turmeric and ginger that we pulled out of our Hugo culture system. And it was then when my farmers went to me and told me, this is successful, can we add more? They were the ones who were convinced already that what we were doing we were on the right track because we were able to produce root crops in our environment and they were truly impressed with the science that we had. So next, next is um, my Santa Cruz property. It's bare because it was a residential development that I basically took over and I started planting all my bamboos here and I wanted to show you a before picture before uh, an after picture also, but I believe in bamboo farming. It's a sustainable wood source. It's, you're able to transform the bamboo into anything from hardwood, poles, fabrics, even food. So even uh, charcoal briskets if you want to. And after five years, it just keeps growing. Little pests that you need for it also. There's no pesticides. So it made sense. So this was the aquaponic pond that I got into and even my consultant back then was saying like, are you sure this is for personal consumption? <laughs> and I was telling him like, I believe the theory is the bigger the body of water, the 
the longer it will take to spike anything. So we have time to either save the plants or save the fish. So that was the theory there. Um, next is a sample of our ampalaya. This was grown also from the human culture system. And uh, we started introducing African night crawlers into our vermicast. And if you notice, this is unprocessed compost. And it's a combination of uh, organic matter and manure. And I'll show you what it looks like also after. Just showing you the greenhouse that we're using in King Tower Farm. And I wasn't super happy with this because I actually asked the greenhouse supplier that I want the internal temperature to be 28 degrees specifically. And he failed to deliver that. And even till today, we're still arguing on the construction method that he did for the farm. So, which brings me to the innovations that we've introduced to the tower farm. Uh, currently, we're operating 252 towers. We're the biggest vertical farm in Asia. And I think we were the first to introduce this to the Philippines because everyone does hydroponics where you're using constant nutrient water. Aeroponics, we turn off the water so that the roots can actually aerate. So, as I said, also soil farming and humal culture raised beds. We have 67 of them currently, and I'll give you a photo later. Um, the aquaponic experiment, we now have 12,000 figure links in the aquaponics. We also have two floating farms, and then we started integrating worms, bees, and livestock into the farm ecosystem. The worms do the vermicasting, the bees do the pollinating, and then the livestock give us the manure, and they actually clear the land for us. And we're also collecting almost 700,000 liters of rainwater for the farm, just in case, you know, when the El Nino does come, we have reserved, even though if we're sitting by the lake, one day the lake might be polluted, so I want to make sure that we're self-sustaining in that sense. And then, yes, the bamboo farm, which my oldest bamboo farm now is only two years old, and uh, I'm hoping in the next few years that we can uh, start harvesting already. So this was Mia. Mia was part of our herd of cows. She actually was sick and uh, she passed away recently. But um, her and her family were basically helping us in the farm. The manure that she would give, you can actually use to make biogas, as we were discussing today. But we also use it as an input for the compost, because the manure is actually where the microbiology starts and it's very essential in the farm. So, I, I put this slide in because um, as I'm talking about innovation, not all tech is good, and when I got into farming, I would rely a lot of the technology and the consultants thinking that they knew what they were doing, and we got sold things that didn't work for us, and he was so sure that this was gonna work, so we had the greenhouse design that didn't work because it didn't achieve our internal temperature. We had cooling pads that were sold to us, not knowing in a high humid environment, you cannot cool any more the air because of the high humidity. So we fought on that also. And then, yeah, they sold me a greenhouse controller that I felt like that didn't work. Here I am in our rooftop farm. This is in Malate, Manila. And it's an indoor rooftop farm, 40 towers, underneath uh, insulated ceiling. We only started to insulate the ceiling because when we were building the greenhouse, our recorded temperature in the city was 54 degrees Celsius. The greenhouse fabric and plastic were breaking already because the temp range was only until 50 degrees. So we had to enclose it, aircon, and grow lights. Now, the grow lights method doesn't yield the same still as sunlight. So it works as a test case, but I'm still not into it. These are our European honeybees, and I'm making friends with them, and feeding them honey because we're trying to support the colony. And I'll talk about the importance of, uh, of our bees later. This is the other shop. This was shot recently in our bamboo farm. And as you can see already, all the bamboos are growing really well. And this is a combination of two types of species. We have the giant asper and the tulda. So we wanted to stick to both because both have their strengths and their weakness. And as I said, in, two, in the next two to three years, we're going to start harvesting this and we're going to create the manufacturing plant also for it. 
So this is what the aquaponic pond looks like now. Um, we have the growth beds in the left and right side, and then we have the main tank and the secondary tank. And we basically have the older fish on the lower tank and then the young fish in the upper tank. Our aquaponic system is actually called a decoupled aquaponic system. We don't recirculate the water automatically so that we can control the output of both how much nutrients go to the plants and how much uh, waste is cleaned before we put it back in the water. So this is a drone shot also of the bamboo farm. And as you can see, it looks very lush now. Um, we did leave all the endemic trees. So if we had fruit trees on the property already and they were homes to birds or pollinators, we did not cut them. So I'm very respectful for those things also. And as you can see, my neighbor's property is bare and blank. Which brings me now to regenerative farming. So you, you guys heard this morning the importance of farming, tourism, and sustainability and food sufficiency. This is something I, I really thought of early on in 2016 and that's what also drove me to go into farming. So I realized that when we were spraying the soil with chemical fertilizers, we were doing it wrong because nowadays the, the thinking is to feed the soil and create a diverse microbiology in the soil that has organisms like bacteria, fungi, nematodes, mites, springtails, earthworms, and that way they're the ones who actually feed the plants. And it's now that, that formula that we're using in our farm. And we're no-till because when you till the farm, you destroy the microbiology, you uproot the ecosystem and you turn it over, which kills them also. And multi-crop plantation. We're, we're not a one crop farm like the, those big farms down south. Up. And we believe kasi, in crop diversity where if one crop gets attacked by pests, you have other crops to sustain your farm. And also, I live off my farm and I can't live on one crop only. That's why I put here multi-crop farm. Permaculture is the idea of creating like a permanent food forest where you design your uh, design your planting so that you have canopy trees, bush trees, and even down to cover crops. So I added water infiltration because in regenerative farming, you actually sort of landscape the property also so that you can collect water and make sure that the water goes to the plants. Um, if you live on a hill, you can actually create swales which will s sort of slow the water down so every time it rains it doesn't just come down the hill and it will actually seep into your ground. And then cover crops, something very important that we've done recently and using legumes to help fix nitrogen into the soil. Our presentation turned off. Sorry? Namatay yung computer mo. Okay. So, which brings me to my next slide, um, apiaries, apiaries are bees, but bees aren't the only important pollinators that we have. There are so many pollinators, but bees are one of the biggest pollinators, and according to the research, coffee yields can double with proper pollination management, and bees <coughs> also contribute to better quality crops, improving size and uniformity. In my farm, we have 320 stingless bee colonies, and then we also have 20 European honey bee colonies. We're still experimenting. Um, as I said, the colonies started declining, and we started fixing the environment, so now we're actually back to 320. And I never say that my farm is organic, but I, I tell people, if the farmer you're buying vegetables from has bees, they're more likely organic. Because if you spray pesticides, the bees will die. So that's a good sign to see if the vegetables you're buying and ask them if you guys have bees. And if they do, then more or less, you can sort of consider them as organic. So the next slide is our... And our clicker is not working. Technical difficulties. So my next slide actually is uh, our stingless bees and our, your, our harvest for propolis and honey.
19 minutes, I still have time. Okay, sorry, so this is the stingless bees. Stingless bees are endemic to the Philippines. They make a very distinct honey. It's actually called sour honey. And uh, they're very easy to take care of. They're stingless because they don't uh, have a stinger, but they do bite. They, they fly into your ears, your eyes, they're very sticky. They're like hard ants. And uh, this was us harvesting for our first time. But actually ever since then we stopped harvesting already. So we're a no honey farm because my main program is to increase the number of colonies that we have. And if you take honey from the bee stores, you actually weaken the colony. And you're forced to give them sugar water, which doesn't make sense. So instead of doing that, we're actually retaining the honey in the colonies so that we can keep uh, dividing the colonies. So this is our European honeybees, and you can see the queen bee there, the bigger bee. So she's walking around, and they're so fun to watch when they're just doing this. Okay, Hugo culture. Hugo culture is a German terminology, which means hill culture. It just basically is following and mimicking the forest floor. When you see an untouched forest floor, you have leaves, branches, logs, manure, you have fungi, you have uh, decomposition, and then you have high humidity. All these ingredients are needed to have rich soil. And in our human culture system, we decided to put it into a, a raised bed. The raised bed helps us remove it from the clay soil so that we know our nutrients stay in one place. And it's actually also easier for the farmers when they're working with the harvest. So these are the ingredients that we have inside the Hugo culture raised bed. The dried logs and branches, cocoa coral, brown and green matter, which is carbon and nitrogen. Manures from cows and chickens, which we harvest from the farm, but we actually also get it from other farms. Um, I, I just want to point out, if you don't know the manure you're getting from a chicken farm, it actually could be... Uh, have trace contaminants and antibiotics. So you actually want to know which farm you're getting your manure from also, because even in the manure, you could have that element. And then we add uh, compost, which the farm makes from the water hyacinth, and then agricultural lime, which helps eliminate acidity, and obviously our vermicast. So speaking of vermicast, this is what the final vermicast looks like. And if it's done right, it has zero smell. And this is what they call black gold in the farming community because you can't make enough of this. It's what you need for almost everything so that they can flourish. So this is our vermicast area where it's actually just a very easy uh, construction of cement. Um, we have these green screens and steel grates because the rats like digging into it. And we have to keep the rats out so that we keep uh, contamination out also. So, I've added this slide we forget because nowadays um, technology hasn't been passed on. We've been programmed to just buy fertilizers, formulas, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. And it's this open loop that doesn't stop. So, what we want with farming is to have a closed loop system where the only inputs you might need is very minimal, which means your farm, farm is self-sufficient. And um, I want to add here the elements also of knowing your soil. That's what helped fast track my farm. When we knew what we were working with, we knew how to work with it and work, uh, work to change it. And then obviously knowing your weather. The weather is very important. Like, I, for the longest time, wanted to grow broccoli, but broccoli doesn't grow in my farm because we're too warm. Broccoli likes uh, 24 below Celsius, and I couldn't achieve it. So, um, terraformation, which I talked about a while ago, which was uh, forming your land so that you can trap water during rainy seasons, and then introducing biochar. Biochar is a very interesting um, aspect. It is burnt carbon, but it is not ash. So biochar, when done properly, is basically a home for microbiology. And that's what you need to improve in your soil if you want um, high yield in your vegetables. And then part of the uh, microorganisms, again, is composting and vermicomposting. And the last would be companion planting. 
companion planting works with if one plant is growing, let's say, to a bush level, but the other plant is growing to a taller level, you can actually plant them side by side because um, you know one plant will only reach a certain height, let's say, uh, 60 days, and then the other plant will take 150 days. So you know by the time it covers it, you can harvest already the other plant and you maximize your space. So this is the water hyacinth in the farm and we're harvesting it from the lake side. And the nice thing with water hyacinth in our farm is it's a free input and it's a high uh, it's a high input for carbon in our farm. So very easy, very easy to use. So I put here no excuses from what I've been learning with farming is you can farm anywhere. You can farm from your bathroom window, your kitchen counter. Recently, I've been looking at sprouts. If you don't know what sprouts is, you can Google sprouts. You can sprout anything in a jar. Who remembers our science experiment when we grew mango on tissue paper? <laughs> That's sprouts, exactly. So there's no reason not to sprout. It says that we think sprouts are garnish. And if you look at the literature nowadays, you can actually sprout almost 20 different seeds, have it on your counter, it doesn't need sunlight, and then in two to four days, you have fresh vegetables. And you actually don't need farms, so there's no excuse. But, um, if you did have a farm like mine, there's a way to transform the soil, which is what we've learned, and is what I'm sharing with you guys. And you technically don't need expensive technology like my tower farms, it's just that the tower farms has its own pros and cons, which I'll get into also. And people ask me how I learned, because I'm not a farmer by trade, um, entrepreneur, hotel graduate, uh, hotel year, family background, but I got into farming as a sheer obsession to counteract all my high impact sports and activities and do something, something for the long run. And it makes me proud to call myself a farmer. And yes, you don't need chemical fertilizers. So this is bell pepper from our floating farm. And it's not very big, but the floating farm has zero maintenance. It's self-watering. And again, it is a cheap way to make produce. And the only problem is when you go to the floating farm, you're wet all the time. But if this is your only way to farm, it's possible. Uh, one, th one thing we encountered when we're doing the floating farm experiment is when the strong winds uh, go through the farm, the plants will lie down because the soil medium of the water hyacinth wasn't compact enough. But if you put the sticks in the trellis, you can actually support everything and you should be able to farm. So one of my favorite vegetables, cauliflower. This is uh, Glenn, my team manager, who's harvesting our cauliflower. And I want to point out, you can eat leaves of cauliflower and broccoli. Please don't throw them away. They're good to eat uh, vegetables. So this is our harvest for the farm. It's a combination of tomatoes, cauliflower, calamansi, mangoes. Um, we have chilies, palermo peppers, habanero peppers, and the uh, city labuyo. So all, all the produce that I grow goes straight to my hotel in Malate. And I feed my guests, and all the excess vegetables we use it to feed our employees. So nothing is wasted for us. This is the Hugo culture raised beds, and we're growing the chilies. And maybe one day I'm actually going to make my own hot sauce. So as you can see, it's an abundant supply and we can't stop experimenting and growing different things in our farm. Um, this is my Kalamansi field as of today. We, are, we're, we manage to harvest anywhere from 40 to 60 kilos every 7 to 10 days. So it's not yet in full, full production. Um, we're going to start line dripping everything so that we can increase production, especially now that we have El Nino on the way. And this is how they look. Very nice, very healthy calamansi. So this is the lettuce from the indoor tower farm. And we just want to show people that, yes, you can farm in the city, in your office. It's possible. It's just very expensive because the electricity costs for the grow lights. And if you guys remember the pet shy, this is how the pet shy looks now.
the Petra leaves are way bigger because everything that we've learned from uh, fixing the greenhouse, learning how to cool down the greenhouse properly, we, we implemented everything and this is the heart of the greenhouse. This is where all the nutrients happen. So I explained all the things that we do on my YouTube channel in case you guys want to do a deep dive on these things. But the water nutrients comes from the bottom and it goes for a UV light so that we can clear out pathogens. It's going into the main tank and the main tank has a small pump on the side. These are dositrons. Dositrons allow us to mix the nutrients. Now we import the nutrients from the US. We have it in powder form and then we pre-mix it in these drums. So this is nutrient solution A and nutrient solution B. What happens is the pump pushes the water through the dositrons. The dositrons will pre-mix everything. And what makes our tower farm different is I remove the pumps from each of the towers and I centralize everything to the pumps behind me. So what happens now is I have a cistern, the cement thing I'm standing on. The cistern collects all the nutrients now. So we pre-mix all the nutrients at one time. It doesn't stay in the base of the pump. And then the white things behind, they're water chillers. The water chillers cool down the nutrients. It's like almost giving your plants a uh, cold beverage. So instead of making my greenhouse temperature 28 degrees Celsius, I basically try to cool the nutrient solution because if you guys didn't know, plants perspire, they transpire. And during the rainy season, we will, um, we will lessen the water content and increase the nutrient content because plants will use less nutrients. And then during the hot season, we will increase the water content and decrease the nutrients because plants will tend to transpire more. So hope, in this way, we are hoping that we can uh, balance it off. So this is how the tower works. The water drips down to the base. And nice thing with the tower is you can pull up the plant anytime to inspect the roots. So what happens is from the ground, the tube is connected to the middle of the tower. And then the pump pushes the water through the center of the tower. And it basically connects at the top. And then it sprinkles back down. The timer of our systems is 12 minutes on, 3 minutes off. The only problem is we're very dependent on electricity, which, which I will talk about in the next slide. So the benefits of tower farming is you can increase yields two to four times of your land area. And we can save 70 to 95% water because we are a closely circulating system. We're not exposed to high heat in terms of the water, so the evaporation is very low. We change the water maybe once a year in the whole system, and then even then we don't throw the water away, we use it to water the rest of the garden. Um, my team, Glenn and Bush, we actually do checks on the water, we check the total dissolved solids, the pH, the electroconductivity, and then from there we can figure out the balance of how much nutrients we need for the plants. So vertical farming is also precise and controlled, allowing for more efficiency. Now, growing in the soil and growing in hydroponics and growing in aeroponics, the studies show that aeroponics can grow almost 50% bigger in yield than the conventional hydroponics. Um, and one of the advantages is you can literally have non-stop production because as soon as you pull out the plant, someone else can put in a new plant. And the plant that you're putting in is normally uh, 10 to 12 days of old already. So your cycle and harvest uh, process is much faster than conventional farming. We were trying to compute. Because my farm is an R&D farm, I keep changing everything. So it's hard for me to tell you that uh, this is my ROI and this is how much uh, I'm making. Because I don't sell my vegetables, I give it to my hotel. And then we actually also keep improving our system, so I don't have the base number yet. But if you remove all the uh, capital expenditures and just go look at the production for the vegetables, I can tell you that we're cheaper than market. So in my farm operation, we operate 252 towers of 940 square meters. And this video went viral on social media because it's cabbage. 
Our cabbage looks this big because it's bolting. It, it doesn't look that big. So it's supposed to close, but when you have a hot environment, it starts to bolt and open up. But when you cut it and stir fry it, it still tastes the same. So we try to sample strawberries. I love strawberries, but again, our environment is too hot for it. But we were able to show that we can grow strawberries. And the advantage of our systems is we can actually grow both fruity veg and leafy veg, leafy greens. And here's a list of things that we grow. I'll give you guys a few seconds to go through that. Um, anyway, after this presentation, I know we have a time constraint, about 34 minutes already. I brought my farm consultant and my manager with me so we can answer any of your questions. I can even share this report with you guys if you want a copy. Um, so the negatives, everyone wants to know, it's a high investment cost. Capital-wise per tower, it is expensive and it has a constant dependency to electricity. If you go out of power for an hour and a half, you basically dry up the plants and once you stunt the plants, they basically throw away so you have to start again. Um, you cannot grow grains, root crops, or bigger trees in the system. And then you have, we have a constant dependency on importing nutrient solutions from the U.S. also. And to optimize your production, you need a greenhouse, and the greenhouses are expensive as well. And it does require some maintenance. So the question Dr. Argobar asked me, what's better, soil or tower farming? And you know, each of them has their pros and cons. I haven't given up on either, or I truly believe that there's home for both in a farm. I think the soil farming grows well for bigger trees, so if you have trellis plants like tomatoes, bell peppers, then definitely soil farming. But for the smaller crops like the lettuces, the pet chives and stuff, Definitely, I think the towers have an advantage also. So this is us cleaning the roots from the system. And every once in a while, they grow into the pumps. So the old system had a water pump in every base, which is something that we removed. Um, this is our greenhouse now. Uh, this is a passive cooling greenhouse over the Hugo culture bed. And then we have the tower greenhouse. So towers are soil. So again, the limitation of the towers, you cannot grow root crops and grains. Um, the bigger plants grow better in the soil because of the space. And normally in the tower systems, if you grow too many big plants in one tower, the base ones don't get enough sunlight, which means um, it doesn't work also for that system. Or it's not efficient in that way. And then, but the advantage also is when the towers you can plant round the clock. Literally, as soon as you harvest, you can plant again. And then, uh, obviously, importing nutrients costs more than making healthy soil in your establishments. Um, eventually, the raised beds or the Hugo culture beds, you need to refill them also, but everything can be found from nature. And one of the discards that we have is rock wool. Rock wool, basically, after two to three uses, we just bury it in our Hugo culture bed. It allows us to keep it, um, the aeration in the soil. So this is me just harvesting some bell peppers from our Hugo culture raised beds. And super, super successful, again, it was an easy thing to do. So our one-year data, we were almost able to achieve 7.3 tons of vegetables on a very small farm. And I truly believe that we were still adjusting a few variables and I think we can achieve maybe 12 to 13 tons. And that's what actually opened me to starting to grow vegetables for other people because we were producing too much vegetables for my hotel already. Okay, aquaponics. I'm almost done. Bear with me. So aquaponics, um, as I mentioned, the aquaponic is a way to grow fish stocks and grow all our easier to grow leafy greens because I didn't want to grow all the expensive leafy greens in the tower farm because we have expensive nutrient solution. So my idea for my farm was to push all the cheaper leafy greens like kampong because kampong grows anywhere. You can have a stream of water and you can plant kampong and it'll grow there. So we wanted to move the kampong, the lettuces, the bread try to aquaponic system and we did the decoupled system because we believe that by decoupling it you can control the nutrients again in 
not try to kill the plants or kill the fish at the same time. The only problem with the decoupling system, it's more complex, higher in cost. And the fact that we're still r and this means it wasn't as easy as I thought. <laughs> so, um, I talked about the microorganisms also. Now, the microorganisms, again, are very important because as I've learned through the years, it's feeding the microorganisms. So the microorganisms can break down the soil, the, the soil will actually feed the plants. So we have to think of it in that logic. So the problem is when you buy chemical sprays, you basically kill the microorganisms because you're putting high nitrogen, high phosphorus, and in, it's not a, I guess it's not an ideal way to do sustainable farming, especially if you're doing it for tourism. Nowadays, people always ask, do you spray pesticides? Are you organic? So it, it's very easy to um, be a pesticide-free farm if you're following the ancient practices. So this is our, our greenhouse, which is the passive greenhouse. I thought that technology would work better than our other design, but it actually still very warm. So I'll breeze through this real quick. I mentioned this already. We use cover crops. Cover crops actually help fix nitrogen into the soil, but they also make sure that during hot days, the soil doesn't evaporate too fast. It keeps it moist, because a moist environment is what the microbiology Likes um, pest management. We don't spray any or get, uh, any chemical pesticides. We use neem oil. Neem oil coupled with uh, fermented chilies, ginger, and uh, aromatics like barley. That and we mix it with a little soap, so it sticks with the leaves. And that's what we use to spray and um, fight the pests in our farm. Our last resort is we actually bring in biological control agents, which is lacewing larvae, earwigs, and uh, praying mantis. So, almost done. So machineries. The machineries that we use in the farm are shredders. Shredders help uh, compost the soil faster. The wood chippers also, the mini dump trucks to help transport things around the farm. Recently, we added the automated drip system, which is one of my key goals is to watch the farmers and see where they spend the most time and see how I can um, increase their productivity, so definitely water, uh, automated drip system definitely helps with that. And then yes, the thermostat control farm, and then the flood and drain system, which I will show a video of. This is our dump truck working and sharing the water lilies so that we can start to shred them. So this is the flood and drain system. The flood and drain system allows us to grow all the baby sprouts and not really manage it anymore. So once you plant it into the rock wall, which is what I'm holding, um, the beds turn off, uh, turn on and off four times a day, allowing us to water all the baby sprouts. So our shredder in action, and the shredder is there to help the worms break down the organic matter faster. If the worms have a very small mouth, so if you give them a very big vegetable, it's going to take a while for them to break it down. So if we shred it like this, it makes composting easier. So those are our other shredders. And yes, I added this slide also. Nothing is wasted. Four slides that bear with me. Nothing is wasted in our farm. We feed my employees. We ferment vegetables. We started fermenting vegetables. We started dehydrating uh, herbs so that we can ground them into a powder. We started uh, freeze drying. It's a very expensive process, but if you want to retain the texture, freeze drying makes sense. And then uh, I promote a lot of using ugly vegetables also. I believe ugly vegetables have a place because as soon as you process them and cut them into your stir fry, you can't really tell anymore that they're ugly. And then the last thing is if we don't use it, uh, for the first few days, we send it back to the compost, and then if not, we feed it to the ducks and the fish. Believe it or not, my tilapia are vegetable fed also. We don't use pellets in our tilapia farm. Oh, so last thing I want to talk about is the rising temperature. So, no one talks about how plants have a hard time above 35 Celsius, and nowadays, you know, this was still the cooler months last year, but nowadays our temperatures has been spiking to about 35 Celsius. And that's when plants start to bolt. And even with all the technology that we've 
implemented in the farm rock. I still haven't been able to bring the temperatures down to a more suitable level, which is something we all need to prepare of because if El Nino is coming, then it's just going to get hotter and hotter. And last, I found a wheat bee and I decided to help it out. So if you ever see a wheat bee, you can feed it honey or sugar water and it will give it strength so it can fly off again. So, which brings me to the second and the last slide. And for me, food security was one of my main agendas when I got into farming. But after nine years of farming and feeding myself and my staff, it now is a way of life that I look at which feels good in the end goal because you're taking care of nature which is taking care of you. So it's this harmonious process that I've developed and I'm so happy to be recognized as a farmer even if I've only been doing this for such a short time. Which brings me to my closing slide. So I always want to question the process and I believe you know the Philippines gets ravaged with typhoons every year. And I was reading the article that 12 billion worth of agri got demolished from two typhoons. And what are we doing different is the question I want to pose. And how can we use technology to help so that the Philippines can have food security, so that we are actually going to be an exporter for food rather than an importer for food. And also, um, with avenues like this, we can hopefully share technology and share the information so that other people can learn these things. Because again, you can farm anywhere and don't be scared to kill your first plant. I killed my first plant and I think I didn't grow with a green thumb, but now I've developed my green thumb to be working. So, um, but yeah, that's it. Um, I, hope, I hope you guys learned anything and if you do have questions, um, you can reach me and my team after the seminar, but we're open for question and answer. Thank you.